Good evening and welcome to Mining the Riches of the Parsha. Tonight is Thursday night, May 30th, 2024. I am so grateful to every single one of you for being here, to be able to spend time together, to study Torah together, and thank you for giving this time. I just want to mention that in terms of our morning schedule, this cut tomorrow morning, Friday, with God's help, we will be together. But Sunday morning, this coming Sunday morning, which is June 2nd, we will not be together because I have something else that I have to take care of. But hopefully after that, we will resume our regular schedule. During these weeks leading up to the holiday of Shavuot, which is it's now under two weeks till we get to Shavuos, Many Jews have the practice to study Pirkei Avos, the ethics of our fathers. This is a slim volume of Mishnah, of rabbinic, Talmudic statements, and it contains very practical wisdom that is both accessible and deep. So I want to share with you, to begin, just a brief example that I heard from Rabbi Melech Biederman. We learn in Pirkei Avos, Kasha Lichos, a person who is slow to anger, literally Kasha means hard, meaning Kasha Lichos, it's hard for them to become angry. The Noach Lirtos, but it is easy for them to forgive. That's a great thing. That, a person like that is called a Chassid. A Chassid, a pious person. I want to interrupt with the parentheses. We are familiar today with a person that we call a chassid, or the plural is chassidim. And we're familiar with, let's say, the members of Chabad, Lubavitcher chassidim, or Satmer, or Bells, or Vizhnitz, or whatever group of chassidim that we're familiar with. It's a, it's a number of groups of Orthodox Jews that have certain practices and customs, and Many of us are familiar with that. That is not what the Talmud means when it uses the term chassid. The word chassid means a person who is pious, a person who is spiritual, a person who is kind and moral. So many chassidim, like the people we refer to today as chassidim, are in fact a chassid. They are pious, moral, wonderful person, but nebach, some chassidim are not. And many non-Hasidim are a Hasid based on the Talmud's definition. And of course, some are not. I hope you're not confused. It is a little confusing, but we're talking about the term Hasid used in the Talmud, the Mishnah and the Talmud. It means a good person, a pious person. Kasha lichos, if it's slow to anger, that's the English uh, idiom that we use, but literally, if it's hard for a person to become angry and the noach lirtzos, and they easily forgive, that's great. That's a chassid. That's a wonderful kind of a person. Noach lichos, the kosha lirtzos. If a person is quick to anger or easily becomes angry, but is very hard or slow to forgive, that's a Russia. That's a wicked person. That's the statement of our rabbis in Pirkei Avos. In the late 1500s to the early 1600s, there was a great scholar whose name was Rabbi Avraham Azula. He lived in Israel. And he wrote an important work called Chesed La Avraham, and he asked the following question. Kosha Lichos, if a person is slow to become angry, it's hard for them to become angry. That's called a chassid. That's a pious, wonderful person. Why should that person be called pious and wonderful, a chassid? A chassid should be one who doesn't get angry. Here we're talking to a person who does become angry. Okay, well, and it's hard for them, but they do become angry. How can you call a person who becomes angry a chassid, a pious, wonderful person? Rabbi Azulay answered as follows. He said, someone who never gets angry, that's a malach. That's an angel. That's not a human being. Every human being, every person gets angry. But kasha lichos literally means 
It's hard. It's difficult. The anger is hard. It's difficult. In other words, Rabbi Azule explains, a person who gets angry sometimes, every human being gets angry, but then they fight against their anger to overcome it, to calm themselves from their anger, to recognize there could be another way to view the situation, or a person who works on themselves to let it pass sometimes and remain calm with effort, with amazing self-control. That is the chassid in God's eyes. And that is what we should strive for every day. This week's Torah portion is the Parsha B'chukosai. It's also the last portion of this book of Vayikra Leviticus, the third book of the Torah. And this week's Torah portion is, uh, is quite harsh. The Parsha begins in B'chukosai Telechu, If you walk in my ways... And you follow my commandments, and you fulfill them, then you're going to get all kinds of blessings. You'll have rains in the proper season. You'll live securely in your land. There will be peace in the land. And then the Torah continues. V'im lo sishmuli, God says, and if you do not listen to me, v'lo sasu is kolam mitzvos and you do not fulfill all these commandments, then we have this long, long passage of the terrible, terrible things that will happen to us. And we read this, and we see, see the, the deal that God is making with us, the, the contract, the covenant that God is making with us, and any person who is honest with themselves will have to say, how are we ever going to make it? Who can live up to that? How are we ever going to succeed? And it's, 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 it's very heavy. It's demoralizing. If we don't keep all of God's commands and then the pages and pages of the terrible, catastrophic things that are going to happen to us, and a person could even think, God forbid, why even try? I mean, it's impossible. Let me try to provide an approach. And let's go back to the beginning. But not exactly the beginning. When the Torah says, near the beginning, God says to the Jewish people, Es mitzvosai tishmaru vasisamosam. I understand what that means. That means to guard God's commandments and fulfill them. So I understand what that means. That means to do what God said and not to do what God said not to do. That's pretty clear cut. Few of us can live up to that, but that's at least I know what it is. But what's the beginning? What's the first phrase? In Bukhukosai Telehu, if you walk in the path of my laws. What does that mean to walk in the path of? And how is that different from the next phrase, to do, to observe? So it's interesting that we refer to the phrase Jewish law as the translation of the Hebrew word halacha. When we say halacha, we refer to Jewish law. Halacha means we refer to Jewish law. And that is the comprehensive system. We're referring to this comprehensive system of our practices and beliefs as Jews. Everything that we do and do not do as Jews. We call that halacha and we translate that as Jewish law. Now, both of these terms are not very accurate. They're not precise, because the term in English, Jewish law, is too narrow a focus, because halacha includes many, many subjects outside of law. It includes um, government. It includes ethics. 
It includes societal priorities. It includes theology. It includes religion. Much more than just law. Halacha, the Hebrew word halacha, means walking, traveling. In other words, going in the path of. That also is not so precise because our because the the term halacha going in the way of walking in the path of doesn't address anything about obligation requirements prohibitions god's commandments are not voluntary we are obligated to command them to to observe them the term halacha seems to say walking in the path of it 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 doesn't exactly cover what we mean to say. Now, our usage of this word halacha to refer to Jewish law, to refer to the comprehensive system of everything we do and don't do as Jews, our usage of that word comes from our Torah portion. In Bechukosai Telechu, that's the same Hebrew word of halacha, a different form of the same word. Meaning, this is the way to go through the day, the way to walk through our lives. At every moment, in every place, in every situation, we have responsibilities to others, we have responsibilities to God, and those responsibilities, those obligations, accompany us wherever we go, wherever we are. Wherever our life takes us, wherever we walk, wherever we go, this is our most comprehension, comprehensive mission in life. That's what we mean by the term halacha. And using this term halacha and not using the phrase Jewish law teaches us an additional profound lesson. I'll tell you a story that I heard from Rabbi Melech Biederman, second time I'm quoting him tonight. One night, late at night, Rabbi Biederman lives in Bnei Brak, which is a small town, it's a suburb of Tel Aviv. And one night, very, very late at night, Rabbi Biederman was driving home to Bnei Brak in Israel very late at night, and he sees on the side of the road there is a man walking toward B'nai Brak. So Rabbi Biederman stops his car, and he says to the man who's walking on the side of the road, can I give you a ride? I'm going to B'nai Brak. You're going to B'nai Brak. I have a car. You're walking. Let me give you a ride. And the man, the elderly man, says, no, thank you. So Rabbi Biederman says to him, but... It's late at night, and it's far to walk from here to B'nai Brak. Get in the car. You'll be home in, ten, in two minutes. So the man says, let me explain this to you. The reason I'm here now is because the doctor told me that I have to walk. I have to get exercise. And that's why, no, thank you, I'll walk. So Rabbi Biederman explained. This man doesn't need to be at his destination. He needs to be walking toward his destination. It's the effort going forward that helps not reaching the destination. We as Jews need to keep the mitzvot, the commandments of the Torah. The Torah is clear. God is clear. We have to guard God's commandments and fulfill them. That's clear. It's hard. We may not live up to it, but that is clear that that's what God wants. But also in God's calculation is the first phrase. Are you working on it? Are you walking toward it? Are you making an effort? Are you trying, even if you don't reach it? That is also what God considers as God considers and evaluates us. 
This word halacha, it's a path. It's an effort, even when we're not yet at our destination. And that is how we can make it through this week's Torah portion. Even if we don't live up to observing everything that God says. So you mean all these terrible things are going to happen? Are we working on it? Are we walking in that direction? Are we making an effort? That's what God is looking for from us. A good speaker knows the importance of a good ending. An ending should be succinct. It should be poignant, memorable, and it should sum up the major themes. The format of this week's Torah portion, as I said before, is a very clear, structured format. In Bechuko Saitelechu, if you walk in my ways, God says, then this, this, and this good will happen to you. These blessings will happen to you. And if you do not listen to me and you do not follow my commandments, then this, 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 on and on, terrible things are going to happen to you. And at the end of that long passage is the following verse. These are the laws and statutes and ordinances that God gave to the children of Israel between God and us at Mount Sinai beyond Moshe through Moshe. Perfect. I mean, it's a little somber. It's a little judicial but it's a perfect ending to the book of Ayikra. It sums up all that we've been talking about. It's a, it's a, a punchy ending to the book. The problem is, it's not the end of the book. Sefer Vayikra does not end with that verse. It continues a few verses longer with a completely different subject. A paragraph that appears appended doesn't seem to be connected. It's a mitzvah of erochin. That's a Hebrew word, erochin. It's a mitzvah. Doesn't seem like a connected ending to the book of Leviticus, Sefer Vayikra. It doesn't seem to be connected to what came before doesn't seem like an appropriate ending point. Just one paragraph kind of hanging there in the middle. This mitzvah of Erechin is voluntary. It's not an obligation. It's a specific type of donation or dedication of money to the Beit HaMikdash, to the Holy Temple. It's like like making a, a pledge to donate to a dath, which you should all do or to any other good organization. Now, so you can, and it has a very specific formula. A person can say, Erech Ploni Olai. Now, the translation of that, it's not a good translation, as I'll show you in a moment, but the translation is, Erech Ploni Olai. I point to a certain person, I say, Erech Ploni, the value, it, the Erech, Erechin means Valuation. The value of that person is a, an obligation on me to donate that amount of money to the Beit HaMikdash, to Tzedakah. Or I could say, Erki Alai, my value. I pledge to give as a donation to the Beit HaMikdash, and then I have to give that amount of silver, that, that number of silver coins. Now, if I say that about myself, or if I say that about somebody else, the amount that I have to give is set. I just say, Eric Plony, the value of so-and-so, then the amount that I actually, I don't have to say an amount. The amount that I actually have to give is determined, it's set amounts. It's determined by age and gender. Now, 
it's a very strange fundraising technique. I mean, if I could say, Erech Erki Alai, the, the value of myself, I pledge to give to the Beit HaMikdash, and I am obligated to give 50 silver pieces. That's what the Torah says. But, you know, I mean, if I want, I could just say, I pledge to give 50 silver pieces to tzedakah, or I pledge to give 55, or I pledge to give 45. Why have such a mitzvah that a person would say in this language the value of myself or the value of that person, and depending on that person or my age and gender, it's a set amount of what I have to give. It just, it sounds very, very bizarre. The answer to this question is, this mitzvah of Erechen, it's not about donations. It's about people. This mitzvah is teaching us that there is a baseline value to every single person without exception. My value fundamentally is not based on what I produce, what I own, what I look like, or what I accomplish. It's not based on any external factor as society around us often seems to do to evaluate people based on these external factors. And some people are inferior to others, are less deserving of protection or care. No. No. God says no. Torah says no. The value of every single person is based on the innate value of a person as a tzelem elokim. Every human being is created in God's image, and that has value. And the mitzvah of this specific, curious pledge of a donation is placed by God in the Torah precisely where it is needed. How do you feel after hearing read in the synagogue on Shabbos, the Tochacha, this long passage of all the terrible things that will befall the Jewish people. God forbid. I'll tell you how I feel. I feel lousy. Every horrible thing that the Torah predicts in this week's Torah portion has happened to us. Most of it within the last hundred years and much of it occurred on October 7th and since. How are we supposed to think of ourselves as Jews after hearing this frightening passage? Have we really forsaken everything? Have we gone so far off the path? Are we really that awful? These are frightening questions. And I do not know the answer. Only God knows the answer to that. But it is inevitable that hearing this week's Torah portion will sadden us. The custom in many synagogues is that when we get to this passage, and it's a long passage, the person who's reading from the Torah reads it very, very fast and in a low, soft voice We don't want to dwell on this. Get it over quickly. It depresses us. It causes us to think worse, less of ourselves. And if it doesn't, it can only mean we're not paying attention. And then, at the very end of the book, comes the mitzvah of Erechen. God says to us in this mitzvah, my beautiful children, even if you do succeed in soiling yourselves on the outside, you are still my children and I love you and you still have purity and goodness within you. And let me show you, when you say Eric Plony Eli, the value of so-and-so, or Eric Eli, my value, every single person from Moshe Rabbeinu to the simplest 
uneducated, non-practicing person, every single person, it's the same 50 shekels, the same 50 pieces of silver. No difference. In other words, God says to us with the mitzvah of Erechen, I am willing to search for the good within you, even when it's not so evident. Now, God is not willing to overlook the bad. The Tochacha, our portion, makes it clear God does not overlook the mistakes and the faults that we have. But finding bad does not blind God to seeing the good within us. We have a weekly reminder of this every Shabbos. On Shabbos, we produce, we don't work, we produce nothing, we accumulate nothing, we rest. Our status on Shabbos is not based on what we do, it's based on what we are. We are God's children. Rabbi Yekusil Halberstam, also known as the Klosenberger Rebbe, was one of the great giants of the previous generation. He went through the most terrible nightmare years of the Holocaust and suffered tremendously. And all through that, he was a leader to his people, to every single person. He had an amount of heroism and selflessness that was just, it's impossible to fully describe. So I want to share with you a story about this amazing man. And this is a story that occurred after the Holocaust ended, after the war was over, and he survived. He went, out, he went on to rebuild his community in a most amazing way. But that's not our story for today. Just after the Holocaust, which was worlds later, he was in a DP camp. He was one of the few broken survivors in a DP camp. And Yom Kippur came. For the first time in years, these Jews could again gather as Jews and observe Yom Kippur. But their bodies and their souls were in such pain. They were so broken. And Rabbi Halberstam got up to speak. And he began to recite the vidui, the confession of our sins that we say on Yom Kippur, and he said, Ashamnu, we are guilty. And then he said aloud, Of what? he asked. What could we have possibly done, he said to his audience, for this to have happened to us? And then he said the next word, but God knew. We have betrayed you, God. And then he turned to the people and he said, how could we be guilty of that? Any mitzvah that we did not perform was only because it would have cost us our lives. We didn't betray God. Gazal knew we have stolen. How can God say that we stole? What did we steal? What was there to steal? Everything was taken from us. And he continued through the list of sins. And for each sin, he stated out loud that in fact they were innocent. The people who were listening were surprised to hear this and they were confused. And then he said, but we are guilty of one thing. He said, there are those in Auschwitz who are guilty and there are those in Mauthausen that were guilty. In Dachau they were guilty and in Treblinka they were guilty. We are all guilty of the same sin. How many of us gave up hope? In our pain and servitude and humiliation, we accepted our tormentor's view of us, that we are worthless, that we don't count, that our lives are cheap. For that, he said to them, 
we must repent. And we must promise never again to forget that every single one of us is a king and a queen. This is the message of Erechim. And that is why it is a fitting conclusion to the portion of Bechukosai, to the book of Bayikra, just when we need it, after the Tochacha, the terrible, demoralizing, depressing passage, now is when we have to hear the mitzvah of Erechim. And we hear it just when we, you and I, need to hear this in the aftermath of and during our experiences of October 7th and every day since. That's why this mitzvah is the conclusion of Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. And in the synagogue this Shabbos, at the end of that, we will all say, Chazak, Chazak, the Nishazek. Be strong, be strong. And we will strengthen each other. My friends, I wish you a good evening and a beautiful Shabbos. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person.